Along to this uh, distinguished lecture by uh, Professor Nick Jennings, who's visiting us from the University of Southampton. Um, he's in the, in the uh, School of Electronics and Computer Science, and, and he heads up the Agents Interaction and Complexity Group there. And as I'm sure many of you know, he's uh, an international authority on agent-based systems and intelligence systems. Um, and he's worked extensively both in, in the academic and theoretical uh, aspects of, of those and in uh, building real systems, engineering systems. Uh, so today he's going to tell us something about the challenges uh, of the uh, putative smart grid that we're all going to be uh, operating with in the future uh, and how agent technology uh, may be able to help with some of those challenges. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, and uh, thanks for inviting me and for spending your evening, or at least the early part of your evening, here. So uh, I want to talk about uh, some of the work that we've been doing, or that I've been doing in Southampton, for a, a, around the last sort of five years. And I come at this, as Nigel sort of said from my introduction, as a, as a computer scientist who's particularly interested in AI and multi-agent system techniques. And so for me, the smart grid is, a, is an application area that I'm interested in applying my techniques to. And so that's sort of my, my motivation. Now, sort of, I came to this and sort of wanted to think of energy as an important domain um, because I wanted to be able to address and tackle something that's, that's a globally important issue and something where I felt actually as a computer scientist I could make a difference to what, was, what is going on in the community. I, I don't think anyone's noticed, you're right. Um, <laughs> in, in terms of the community and, and sort of have some real impact in terms of the, the work that we wanted to do. So energy is important as a global social issue for sort of three main reasons. One, one is that there's a finite amount of resource out there and we're using it up at quite a rate, and um, at some point soon, what, what we have, especially in terms of fossil fuels, fuels are going to get uh, depleted to a level where it's simply not sustainable what we're, what we're doing at the moment. Second point is energy security. The resources that we have around the world are not evenly distributed. They're not necessarily in the most stable of, of environments and countries, many of them, and so there are serious issues about sort of security and how we can have a secure energy supply. And then finally, also issues associated with climate change. So the way that we currently operate with energy and our cu energy current status quo is something that, that has to change and is gradually changing over time. Now, for me, addressing these issues requires changes in the way that we use energy. So I think we need to think of it much more as a scarce and valuable resource. So we need to understand the way that it's used, and the implications of the way that we use it, in a way that I don't think we do at the moment. I think we need to think about how we can use it more efficiently, uh, and the government is going to achieve this through greater electrification of greater parts of transport and heating, especially sort of targeting at CO2 em emissions, and also in terms of uh, low carbon sources. So these are going to be a much more important part of our energy mix than they have been to date. And so sort of in that context, I came across, as I said, a number of years ago, the sort of notion of a, of a smart grid, a next, next generation energy grid. And if you look at a description of it, I found a number of terms and concepts that as a computer scientist, I felt I could do something about. So sort of as here characterized, uh, two-way flow of electricity and information, concepts of distributed intelligence, automated control system, real-time markets and transactions. They're things that I've been working on as a computer scientist for 20-odd, 20 25 years now. And so for me, this was a, an interesting challenge of, that I thought I had some tools and techniques that I could bring to bear. And so that's what, that's what led me to work in this particular area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about four main areas of work that we've been involved with in Southampton within this sort of broad space. So energy tariff recommendations, smart heating control, 
uh, electric vehicles, is what that should say, and virtual power plants. So these are the four main areas that I'm going to, to talk about. So I'm going to specifically start uh, with the personalised tariff recommendations. So home energy tariff selection is a complex and uninteresting process. I find it uninteresting and I'm quite interested in sort of energy and its general use, yet I find it difficult and, uh, to get motivated to do something about this. So as of last year, there were about 120 energy tariffs that you could sign up to in this country, and most people, so sort of seven out of 10, aren't on the best tariff for them. So sort of there's lots of complexity here, there's lots of people who are not motivated to be in the right space, and yet energy is an increasingly expensive endeavour. There are some ways of trying to cope with this, so like many facets in life, there are comparison websites which you can go to, so sort of U-Switch is probably the main energy one, but there are, there are a variety of others, which last year ran a sort of their own energy tariff uh, process where you could sign up with which and sort of join the, their tariff. But there are lots of sort of issues associated with this. So in order to do this well, you have to figure out how much you're going to consume, how much is peak off peak, uh, how, how do you make the use the best use of the data that you've got. There are issues about who's using that data and sort of how the electricity is supplied. So there's a number of issues associated with this. And the government has uh, thought of a number of mechanisms to try and encourage people to change more. And so there is uh, efforts to restrict the number of tariffs and to sort of um, to make it simpler to change, to make it much more of a market, and yet still, in general, people don't change very much, despite the sort of savings that are on offer. So that's sort of about 10% of, of a typical energy house bill. So what we wanted to do in this space, um, which is what we've, did through, we've done through a system called Agent Switch, is to make this easier for people to do and to be able to operate. So to do this, we wanted to automate bits of this and take uh, some of the drudgery away from it, so to make it much, much easier to do. So to do this, we built a system called Agent Switch, and sort of it's got four main things that I'm going to talk about in this context. So firstly, it will do things around predicting your consumption. It will do things like find the best tariff for you. It will offer personalized recommendations, and it will try and understand your trade-offs and preferences as a user. And I'm going to talk through each of those in a bit more detail. So what we've done is we've instrumented about 50 homes in Nottingham. So this is a joint project, or this has been done under a joint project with Tom Rodden at the University of Nottingham and ourselves in Southampton. That's the street in Southampton that we, where we've put all these houses. It's not where we've put the houses, where we've put the smart meters. Okay, the houses we didn't build as part of the grant, you'll be pleased to know. Um, so within these, we've instrumented them up. Uh, we've used some commercial off-the-shelf kit. So we've used Alert Me meters that you can buy uh, and you can easily put and install in a home. And sort of depending on how proficient you are at this, this can take a quarter of an hour to an hour or so is, is our experience. So these are sort of monitors that go on your existing system. They, they clamp to, your, to the wires that go into your electricity meter and then you're able to take readings of what's going on. And so we've done a number of things with this. Firstly, we've developed new prediction techniques to estimate annual consumption. So rather than having to go to your bill for the last quarter or last number of quarters, which is what uh, something like U-Switch will ask you to do, actually we're able to build up a very much more accurate profile of, of you throughout the year so that you're able to be, be much clearer about what energy you are consuming. Okay, so we've developed a new technique. I'm not going to go into it. Um, it's, a, it's a Bayesian uh, prediction and learning technique for those who are interested. And what it will do is it will predict uh, what you're trying to do based on a relatively small amount of readings. So it will be able to do this and it will account for seasonality and those, those sorts of things. So this is one of the techniques we've used to help us predict better energy consumption. 
Now, this is sort of in a context where we've installed a bit of infrastructure. Now, the UK government has plans to install smart meter infrastructure for, in everyone's homes, in all of our homes, by I think they're up to about 2018, 2020 now. But sort of here we're targeting at the sorts of information that will be available standardly within these, these um, systems. We also wondered what's the sort of minimal structure that we could get away with and make useful predictions for. And so we built and designed that thing uh, on your top right hand side. So it kind of looks like a USB stick. It's about the size of a USB stick. And what it is is a simple temperature monitor. So it, it, you, we, we've run a trial, which I'll detail in a while, and so it, you get sent it through the post, you open the envelope, you press the green button on the top, and then you put it on top of your thermostat. Because your thermostat is the one thing in your house that actually controls all your heating. So the temperature can be lots of different, uh, depending on the size of your house and the uh, geometry of it, your temperature can be very different in different rooms, but actually the things that controls your heating is what the temperature is at, is at the, at the thermostat point. And so what we try to do is just from that one sensor, and we take a week's worth of reading, so you sort of you press the button on the top, you put it on your thermostat, you leave it there for a week, it then flashes red to say it's done, and then you unfurl it, so it is, it is a USB stick that you put into your uh, computer and then it will connect to the web page, upload your data, analyze your data and figure out sort of lots of things about your energy usage. So we've run this in a trial, uh, we ran it over the winter, so we sort of had about 650 users that we sent this to and the picture there, which you're not meant to see in detail, is the, is the web page you get to when you upload, so when you insert the MyJulo um, uh, piece into into your laptop, into your laptop or, or PC or whatever it might be. And so what we found from this data that we're still in the process of analysing is actually the sort of average savings that you could get if you set it much more to to standard averages are sort of 10 to 20 percent. So that's sort of 100 to 200 pounds a year. And the sorts of things we're able to predict are what your set point temperature of your thermostat is. Uh, the thermal decay on your house, so sort of how leaky it is, how much heat uh, you lose to the, to the environment. We also had the joy of identifying two faulty sensors where, uh, with a couple of our, our houses who were convinced it was our dodgy bit of kit that we'd sent them, and actually it was their thermostat that was wrong, so our, our bit of kit was very much more robust than they thought. Um, in the sense of determining out the setting. And so this we're working with, with DEX, the Department of Energy and Climate Change, to roll out a much bigger national trial on. So this is, you know, this is 650 people spread around the, the UK. We want to tr sort of try and take that up an order of magnitude or so. And so we're speaking with DEC about that. We're also discussing with a couple of energy charities um, here uh, who are concerned with energy poverty. Because actually what this does is a very simple way of identifying houses where savings can be made and also sort of targeting interventions at. So you can identify through this the houses that are poorly insulated because you can construct, we construct a model of the house and its leakage rate and then what you're able to do if you were a social landlord or a big landlord is you would be able to target the, um, the the interventions that you could make at those houses actually where it would make a difference. So some houses are very well insulated and it wouldn't make very much difference. It wouldn't make very much savings and it wouldn't add very much value. In others, it really would make a difference. And so this is, you know, this is from one reading, sorry, this is from a reading in one place uh, over a week, we're able to sort of infer these things. So that's the first bit, sort of understanding the, the usage and the sort of predicting consumption. The next bit is sort of finding out the best tariff. And here, all we're doing is we're connecting to uh, U-Switch. So U-Switch is a comparison website. They kindly let us, uh, they gave us their APIs. And so we connect to the tariffs behind it. So that's where our source of the domain data is coming from. We could connect to other ones. Uh, U-Switch were generous enough to, to give us theirs. So we're able to sort of feed in these predictions about what, what usage is, is going to happen in order to work out the sort of standard tariffs. And so you can sort of take it very much like that. And so 
That's the, that would be the standard sort of use of these comparison websites. Also, however, also you can sort of go further and you can go inside this and sort of figure out what is going on and sort of ask for some explanation of it. So this is where we get to the personalized recommendation bits. So we are able to identify from the alert me kits, so the sort of more detailed kits, the sorts of energy profile that you have, the sorts of things that you have going on within your house, so the things that is consuming energy and the times at which you're doing it, and then to be able to make recommendations that are personalized to you. So we've learned from your house what it's like, the leakage rates, we're taking your data, and then we're making personalized recommendations to you. To be able to do this, we have um, quite a neat piece of uh, machine learning here where we, we infer from the signal, so from the overall signal going in to the, into the meter, what appliances you have running within your house. Now, we can't do this for all appliances yet. We're not that clever. But there are a number of main domestic appliances that we can pick out pretty readily. So fridges, we're really good at identifying your fridges, what they look like within that. Same for showers and some of the bigger usage. We can't get individual kettle uses very readily. But it lets you predict, and you know, we're working on this and sort of predicting out ever more. Uh, and this is, remember, this is not, this is learnt all of this. So this is learnt that that spike or that profile there is your fridge. It's not been fed it. You haven't told it that you've got a fridge and that it's this make and model. It's learnt that. It's inferred that. And the same for the, the shower. So sort of the amount that you're having to do here is, is nothing other than once you've set it all up, this is the information that you're, you're getting. And so that's the sort of personalization and sort of really trying to remove lots of barriers to it. In, in complement with this, we've also sort of explored a, um, a system where it's not fully automated, but you engage with the, the homeowner. So the first one is a completely automated system. This is more mouse. This is a system where you as the user are engaging with your data. So you get at the end of the day or whatever, whatever period of time you wish to be able to do this on, you sort of say, okay, at this time I had a shower. At this time I was watching the TV. At this time I was doing some cooking. And so you can sort of, you can annotate more or less detail depending on what you're doing. And then this will help, you know, if you can get this information and get enthusiastic users to do it, Consistently, then you're able to get much more information than we're able to get non-intrusively in a fully automated set setting at the moment. And then this lets you explore what sort of appliances you have. It let lets you visualize that actually you're spending quite a lot using your, um, using your computer and your, and your TVs or you're using quite a lot in terms, of, uh, in terms of heating water or dishwashers and so on. And it lets you explore that so that you get to understand what your individual profile is and, and what you might like to do about it. So it sort of lets you explore and sort of imagine, imagine you don't do this and you, or you defer this to this particular time. It will let you explore those sorts of things. The bits where we're still sort of um, doing more work on is on the, on the preference elicitation side and the sort of data uh, accountability side. So the, those first bits we, we're very happy with and they, they all seem to work. We're working on how we can do preference solicitation for this. So, you know, if you're willing to get up at 3 a.m. In the, in the middle of the night to turn on your washing machine, then that's great. You may be willing to do that. That might be your preference to save a pound at most, I would guess. Um, but maybe you are. So what, what sort of cost and comfort trade-offs are you willing to make? So sort of some understanding of that so that sensible actions can, be, um, can follow from it. And also what we want to be able to do is to make sure that the decisions and the data that we're using to make these decisions we're able to account for because we're in the end going to make recommendations that people are going to, to change, uh, change their behavior and they're going to spend money on them. And so we want to be clear on the data. And so we have work going on that's connected to the uh, work going on in the W3C provenance uh, standard committee here. So we're provenance and enabling 
all of these decisions. So we're keeping a track of what data we're using in the calculations, how you get those, and sort of making inferences over those. We tend not to present a provenance graph like that to users, and we're trying to figure out how, how that interface will, will look like it in the future. So that's the sort of first bit. That's the sort of tariff recommendation bit. Second bit I want to talk about is the, is the smart heating controller. So sort of as I've alluded to a bit, um, the, the amount that we spend on, uh, or, or the amount of CO2 emissions that come from domestic energy usage is, is a reasonable part of the UK uh, uh, output, and uh, quite a lot of this is down to heating. This is likely to get more complex if things like heat pumps and time of use tariffs, so tariffs that change during the course of the, the day. So at the moment, the time of use tariff we have is an economy seven one, so it gets cheaper after a fixed time and then come, comes back on again in, in the morning to being more expensive. There are trials and plans to, to vary that throughout the day, uh, depending on the cost of generating. Okay, so if that happens, then that gets even more complex. And what we want to be able to do is to construct and provide help and assistance uh, in order to be able to model the home and to be able to do this in a smart and effective way. So we've constructed um, thermal models of the home, much like uh, I've spoken about under agent switch, so we can sort of work out the thermal leakage rate and the sort of heater output. We are able to combine these with uh, local weather predictions. So here we, use, we take forecasts that exist on sites like Weather Underground, which will give you sort of a postcode specific, um, a postcode specific forecast of temperature. And actually then what we, lo uh, what we learn is the correlation between the prediction for your area, so your postcode, and how it is at your house. So we don't invest lots of compute power trying to do weather prediction. There's people who, who do that, and they, they have huge, great computers. What we learn is uh, we learn the difference of how how this rating that it says for you relates to what you get at your house. So you might always be, you might be in a sunny area or windy area, and so you might always be two degrees different from it at, a, at its most simple level. And then what we are able to do is to, with those, uh, with those characteristics, we're able to optimize our energy use to maintain the comfort whilst sort of providing feedback and heating the room while the energy is cheap. So that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. So we have developed a, a machine learning uh, way of being able to cope and make predictions about what goes on in a house. So sort of it's a, it's a latent force model that is a reasonably standard thermal model. And then what we try to learn is what's the variability in the sorts of things that it can't account, that the simple thermal model can't account for. So, you know, that's people going in and out the house, that's people opening doors, that's people doing cooking, that's, that's people extra heat sources and so on. So learning that in a, in a periodic fashion. And we seem to be able to do that quite well. So this technique works reliably and makes good predictions for the houses that we run it on. We're, as I said, we're in the process of running this, or sorry, we have run this at the University of Southampton homes for uh, over last winter, so for about a six month period. And what we're able to do is we're sort of able then to present different forms of information to people. So sort of while it's learning, and you get reasonable predictions after about a day, you, you can get better predictions the longer you leave it running. It just sort of, we have a reasonably standard uh, thermostat uh, on a digital tablet, but uh, reasonably standard in function where you sort of set the temperature and that's, that's how it works. However, once you've learnt all of those things, so once you've learnt your profile, the weather predictions, your thermal leakage, then you're able to do, uh, you're able to make predictions and present much more information. So you can put a cost on those things. So if you want it at 20 degrees, then that's what the cost is going to be. And so you can make predictions about that. You can present uh, things in terms of other units that you might care about. So you might care about the amount of CO2 that it's putting into the environment in order to heat it at that particular temperature. You might, I think it's going to come to it, you might want to say, I'm willing to spend £1.60 
£1.50 uh, today on heating my home, do the best you can. Make it as comfortable as you can for £1.50 a day. So once you've learnt all of those things, then those, that's the sorts of things that you're able to do and to manipulate. And so, we, as I say, we can construct a predictive model because we've learnt those things, and then we're able to, to sort of play and operate with it. So here's a sort of visualisation of the, what the agent system is doing. This is not what the user sees. This is what we look at ourselves. So you've got a number of things in the environment, external temperature, wind speed, solar radiance, etc. Here we're merrily learning the leakage rate of the house. So that's the thing in the top right for, for you and sort of the heater output. And then we're able to start make predictions. So sort of we're able to predict the external temperature where the red line is the actual temperature, the sort of grey line around it is, is our predictions. Same for, for carbon intensity. And then we're able to optimise as best we can uh, against a standard thermostat. So what we do is we work out that, okay, if you want to, if you set your standard thermostat at 20 degrees for these times, we can, we have a, we use a model, the ASHRAE model in, in particular, that works out that that gives you so much comfort, okay, in whatever units you want to measure comfort. Then what we do is we'll do an optimization that will give you at least that amount of comfort, but either cheaper or a lower carbon emission or any other criteria that you would choose to put in, some combination of the pairing. So sort of that's, that's learning and that's personalization and then that's sort of operating to you and, and your environment. Okay, that's the, that's the heating control aspect. The third one I want to talk about, the third piece of work is work that we've been doing in the area of electric vehicles. So government plans are that one of our key one of the key things that we're going to do in order to, um, in order to deal with CO2 emissions is that we're going to make sure that uh, we, we have greater electrification of the transport context. And so what, we, what people are doing are looking at EVs, electric vehicles. You can buy them now. There are, some of them are around. But when you start to do this, then that puts quite a lot of a strain on the existing infrastructure that's meant to support these. So if you think about charging at home, for example, so a typical household uses 10 kilowatts of power uh, per day. An EV battery, so I think this is for a Nissan Leaf, is 24 kilowatts. So that's quite a, uh, that's quite a lot in comparison to an individual household usage. And the problem on the infrastructure here is at the local transformer, so sort of something that's at, at the level of a, of, a, of a community, has very limited capacity. And actually, if you all come home at the same time and you all want to charge your EVs, then there's going to be a problem. It's not going to be able to cope with this. Same with sort of en route charging. So EVs will go 50, 100 miles, something like that, depending on how lucky you are. So if you make lots of short journeys, that's fine. If you want to make a slightly longer journey, you need to charge en route. So you need to be able to go somewhere and use plug-in as part of the infrastructure. So if you look at Edinburgh, as checked yesterday, I think there are uh, three public charging stations for, uh, in central Edinburgh. And so what you want to be able to do is to figure out and schedule appropriately uh, that you get to those. So. What we've done is we've taken our, our approach to doing this is we want to be able to utilise this charging infrastructure both at home and on the go within the constraints uh, of, of the environment in which it has to operate. And our approach to doing this is to take tools from mechanism design. So mechanism design is a, is a part of game theory uh, that deals with allocations and payments, which is what this is a problem is. And so what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to design mechanisms, so allocations and payment rules, that have a number of properties. In particular, we'd like these four properties. So incentive compatibility means that we would like um, the agents who participate in this mechanism just to be able to tell the truth about what their preferences are, not to have to lie and to figure out that actually if I put this, then this is going to be better for me, but if so-and-so does this, then uh, that may 
I might have to deal with that. Just to be able to design a payment structure where you simply put in the truth. Okay, so if you can do that, that's an incentive compatible mechanism. We want it to be efficient, so we want it to make good allocations. We want it to be individually rational, so we want to make sure that you don't lose out by participating. If you lose out uh, more than you need to, then you're not going to participate. And we like it to be budget balanced, so in general we want the mechanism not to have to subsidise or burn money uh, in, terms of, uh, in order to make it the other characteristics. So these are sort of four standard uh, things that, uh, that uh, one aspires to in mechanism design. So what we've done is we've taken that and sort of applied it to the EV context. So firstly, we've worked at home charging. So this is an online mechanism. So things arrive during the course of the mechanism. So you don't have all the cars at home and then make an allocation. Cars arrive at different times and with different constraints. So on each arrival, the driver or in our case, the agent for the driver, uh, reports their charging requirements. The mechanism, which is the thing that we've designed, uh, schedules the charging. So it will figure out which of those it can allocate, which of those it can't. And then on departure, yeah, the driver pays the mechanism. So our mechanism, which is a variant of a second price Vickery auction, for those who are interested, but just think of it as a, as a mechanism, as a, as a payment rule, we can show that it has all, all of those characteristics. So that it's incentive compatible, rational, and budget balanced. And so we took this mechanism, and then what we did was we, evaluate, we have evaluated on, a, on the cabled data trial. So cabled was a, an EV electric vehicle trial uh, in this country. So they gave out 110 vehicles and track data for over four years. So we got access to that. We then sort of took uh, driving behavior from, from real data. So we took samples of these and sort of uh, worked out journeys related to GPS appropriately anonymized so as we weren't invading anyone's privacy. And then sort of took constraints uh, from typical household uh, electricity consumption. And what we found was that actually our mechanism worked very well, so it was able to be very efficient, so sort of close to 90 odd, 95 percent efficient in terms of making these allocations. And so it was very good, it had all these other desirable properties, but actually it gave very good answers as well, and sort of much better, especially as you got more EVs, so especially as the problem got harder to deal with, so there were more EVs in the given environment, then our efficiency went up dramatically over, over what was there previously. The en route stuff, um, you can already see in parts of the world. So these are a couple of systems in America and Canada where you, can, you have iPhone apps uh, for EV uh, drivers who want to travel a long distance. You sort of use your app to say where are the EV charging points and at some of those you can make advance reservations. So you can sort of say I'm going to be this should be my route, so you can imagine it being coupled in with a, with a sat-nav and sort of say, okay, this is my route, this is the one that is best for me to go to, and they want to make an advanced reservation. So that exists today in small parts of the world. And so what we wanted to do was look at a mechanism, so how could we design a system that would do this effectively? Um, the, current, the, way, the way the current system works are, are, are very simple, and I think you can, we can do much better in terms of... Uh, by using proper aspects of mechanism design. So this is a two-sided market, right? So you've got car drivers who want to get charging, you've got EV charge points who want to get cars to them and charge money. So you have a sort of two-sided market. What we wanted to show and uh, achieve in this particular one is we, uh, we use a, a greedy allocation rule. So we're able to sort of use quite a simple allocation rule uh, for, for drivers and so that they, they figure out which ones they want to go to, and then we can show that this is incentive compatible, so no one has to lie, no one has to speculate about others, uh, but show that if we have that on one side, then actually on the station side, you, can't, you cannot devise a mechanism that will have all the de desirable properties that we're after. So we have to relax some of them. And so um, 
and, and evaluate them. And so what we did was we took a number of standard mechanisms that worked with this greedy allocation rule, and we found out, again, that actually a second price mechanism, so a particular uh, rule was the most effective in terms of, again, being efficient. And interestingly, one of, the, one of the standard rules that's sort of used in game theory, which is sort of critical value pricing, um, actually doesn't really work at all. So sort of, again, designed the mechanism uh, uh, that worked and, and sort of applied it to, to these particular problems. So the final one I want to talk about is... Uh, is the virtual power plants. So this is, and this talks to the sort of um, the renewable side of the, some of the problems that we spoke about. Renewable has many desirable attributes. The undesirable one is that from a grid level point of view, they're, they're very small, uh, very small feed-ins and they're very difficult to cope with because they're quite unpredictable and they don't all come together. And so what you want to be able to do is to get, if you can get a number of these small energy providers to group together, come together as a collective, then by, if you can arrange the collective to be formed in an appropriate way, then you can get much greater aggregate predictability. Okay, so you want these to be able to come together, figure out what's the best way to do it in the best groupings, and then sort of be, um, be much more effective, predictable, and usable at a grid level. So here, the challenge we looked at is how we can sort of incentivize the agents who are acting as, the, on, as proxies for the various renewable uh, providers. So it could be a, on a wind turbine, it could be on a, a piece of PV, it could be wherever. We want them to give truthful estimates because if we get truthful estimates or the best estimates possible, then we can make better predictions and better use of them. So we used uh, we used a particular technique. Again, it's a mechanism design technique called scoring rules. And scoring rules have been in existence for a, for a long time within the literature. But what we had to do here was to adapt it and take it and sort of apply it within our particular context. So what we do is we set up a, a scoring rule where the payment functions are super linear. So if you have two of you joining together, then there's more than twice the value in that. But it doesn't go up continually like that. It's a sort of logarithmic function that sort of flattens off eventually, so you don't just end up with the grand coalition. So it encourages coalitions to form because you get more value, but it doesn't encourage all of them to join because um, you just end up with the grand coalition. So what you have to do to participate within this is you have to, each agent has to report its expected production and also the confidence that you have, so the variance that you want to produce with that. And then the scoring rule will, uh, will incentivize the agents to report these things in the best way possible. So here's a couple of sample uh, scoring rules. So if you look at the red triangle there, this, is a, this, is a, this could be a prediction from one agent uh, that's got high confidence. So it's really confident it can deliver uh, 400 units of production, okay? And so that's what it said. It said, you know, I'm really confident about this. This is what I'm able to achieve. And if you hit that target, you do well. You get the most, uh, you get the most, the uh, highest payment. However, if you fall away from that, then actually you do quite poorly in terms of the payment slash penalty that you end up paying. If you're less certain, then you give a, a more rounded uh, broader distribution, so the green one, I think green's just about visible up there, so that's a lower confidence prediction. And so you don't get as much if you get it spot on, you're 400, but uh, actually the, the, the pain for, for being further away from, from the target is, is much less correspondingly. Okay, so that's the sort of scoring rule idea. And so what we then did was we took uh, data from Ecotricity, which is a is a wind or is a green energy provider in this country. So they've got 16 uh, sites at the time that we did this. That's the big, that's the big um, windmill type things there. And then for each farm, what we did was we uh, logged the um, wind speed data at each of these, and we were able to sort of make predictions from them using our sort of using our prediction algorithms sometime in advance. And so what we wanted to be able to see from this 
is sort of, would, is it worthwhile them forming into coalitions, into collectives? Do they do better? Does the grid do better? And sort of um, how, good, how good of predictions can we make? So what was, we found was that actually being in a, in a cooperative uh, is always better than selling into the market as a, as a single agent. So there was some value in coming together with others. So that's the sort of blue lines being above the red lines in general. And the, the scoring uh, rule-based payments are better than um, the, another state-of-the-art algorithm that didn't take into account the, the variance of prediction. You've just got average predictions without confidence levels associated with it. We found that um, depending on the time in the mechanism when you were forced to make predictions, lo and behold, if you made predictions further into the future, that was harder, and so you got lower payments. I don't think that's much of a surprise. Uh, but actually, the, the scoring rule will still encourage the agents to make predictions, but to, to be honest in the level of accuracy that they, could, um, that they were able to, to associate with that. So sort of that's some sampling of some of the work that, that we've been doing uh, in Southampton over the, over the last number of years. The, we, this is kind of encapsulated in a CACM article that was published last year. So actually, that's a rev that reviews almost all of this work. It also has the same title as, uh, as this talk. And so sort of for me, um, I, I'm interested in this domain because I find it ex exciting and important as a, as a real world domain. I come at it from a multi-agent system background, but it's great to be able to work in a domain where there is real data, where there is lots of opportunities uh, for, for deployability. I also think that sort of this area in particular is very much uh, in need or can benefit from state-of-the-art work in advanced computing methods. So I've sort of spoken about autonomous decision-making, I've talking about how we can engineer effective incentives, how we can do personalization and adaptation, and I've touched a bit upon sort of humans and agents working together as teams in order to do that, so what I would call human-agent collectives. I've stood up and give this talk. Um, of course, the people who've done most of the work are these folk here. Thank you very much. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.